Good afternoon, everybody. This is a, a privilege for me to uh, have everybody join our podcast today on the social determinants of health with two distinguished leaders in the healthcare space. I have the privilege to have uh, today Dr. Sean Lucan, who is a physician leader. Uh, he is, uh, has an extensive background in the academic world uh, from his time at Albert Einstein, at University of Pennsylvania and at Yale. He is currently Vice President and Medical Director at EHE Health, working on prevention. And his work spans from uh, food and nutrition uh, and also been extensively involved in the pandemic. Uh, I, would, uh, I would just let him uh, you know, tell us, enlighten us on, on what, uh, the, what are the areas he's been involved with when he takes over. And uh, of course, extensively published uh, textbooks as well as journal articles. He has also been a fellow at the National Academy of Medicine. It is really a privilege to, to have him with us to discuss today uh, the important topic of the social determinants of health. And I have Dr. Baran Erdik, who is our own um, distinguished advisor in the uh, advisory board of uh, CCM Health. He is a state survey agency uh, regulator for CMS, uh, and he is also our advisor on regulatory compliance, practice transformation with a focus on value-based care. Let's have Dr. Lucan uh, join in first. I mean, at some point I have to... <laughs> As Dr. Baran is a little bit in-house, uh, this this is like a, 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 you know a good way to have Dr. Lucan join in right away. Please. Well, uh, thanks for the invite and thanks for having me. I think this is an important uh, discussion and uh, you know a topic that uh, really deserves attention. You know, especially in, in light of the pandemic and all the uh, changes that have occurred in uh, the new normal as we have it. So. Um, you know, as mentioned, I'm Sean Lucan. I'm a family doc by training, uh, public health researcher and epidemiologist. I've been in academic medicine for the last 12 years uh, and I've just uh, recently joined EHE Health, which is a company uh, laser focused on prevention for corporate clients. Um, and so we see the full gamut of, uh, you know, health issues in that scope and trying to keep people well and providing uh, preventive care and lifestyle medicine. Excellent. Dr. Baran? Uh, thank you for the great interaction, JFL, and thank you for having me and Dr. Lucan here today. As you said, I am more from a regulatory perspective, so I'm a physician first, but one of the fees to grass was greener on the other side, so I've been dealing with CMS and state regulations for the last five to ten years almost and the way things are going, they are here to stay and a lot is changing. Of course, with, with CMS, uh, a lot of things are changing. That, that I have uh, for sure noted down. Um, uh, Dr. Lucan, what's new in the health-related social needs area, please? Um, what's new? Well, I, I think what's new is a real focus on equity. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, we've historically talked about uh, the triple aim in healthcare. Uh, you know, and, and that's uh, you know care experience, quality, uh, and cost. Uh, you know, more recently, that's been updated to be the quadruple aim, in, incorporating concerns about you know physician well-being and physician burnout. And then I think uh, recently, uh, I want to say it was in one of the you know family of uh, JAMA journals, uh, there was an editorial about you know, the quintuple aim, which, you know, also incorporates equity and an equity lens. And I think that's a real focus of healthcare delivery today and appropriately so, um, because, you know, I think uh, healthcare disparities in particular have been thrown into high relief with the pandemic and all the upheaval uh, that has followed from it, uh, both in terms of health and healthcare and just social determinants, you know, as we're talking about today. So this is... Uh... It's, it's always a good time to talk about value-based care. Yeah. And value-based care is straight from the Affordable Care Act. And even today in 2022, uh, mm -hmm. fee-for-service is the overwhelming manner that you know, uh, medical activity is conducted. And fee-for-service has its limitations that are you know, time immemorial. We are talking about you know, value-based care is the, the idea of using uh, the, the quality 
divided by cost model where you're able you, you, you want to bring out value as as the driving force and, and not just monetary gain, which is basically what fee-for-service is uh, at the end. I mean, of course, those who have the, the willingness to do uh, good clinical work, they will always you know, be able to do good clinical work no matter what, but the driving force, the, the, the incentive is not there to do, to do quality work. The incentive is to, to keep uh, you know, piling up uh, consultations and doing more and more procedures. So. Even today, I mean, going forward, value-based care is, you know, uh, is is gaining traction. And Dr. Barant, if you can, like, just, you know, yeah, so, jump, jump in uh, and tell uh, us. Dr. Lucan said, right, it's becoming more and more important from value-based purchasing, value-based care and everything. I mean, one thing I'd like to maybe add is it's going to be really interesting to see in the next couple of months from a CMS uh, insurance perspective because of the rollback of pandemic protection, because they, there will be a lot of Medicaid members who will lose coverage to uh, Medicaid. So the question then will become, will insurance be able to shift these people to subsidize marketplace plans? And that also throws in a nail in the coffin of the providers as well. If you're a fee-for-service, if you're billing Medicaid this or that, what are you going to do if you lose 10%, 20% of your patient population or if they become uninsured at one point? So I think this even furthers what you said. This even furthers the case against fee-for-service, as I like to call it, and the case for value-based healthcare. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, from a CMS perspective, especially from the perspective of the current Biden-Harris administration, the further you advance the health equity part of things, the further you will advance value-based purchasing because at the end of the day, we want to ensure that a dollar spent is a dollar we get back in healthcare. We don't want to create two separate pathways uh, in healthcare, one for those who have the means, one for those that don't have the means. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what the, the new Medic Medicaid end of emergency COVID related. We'll get back to COVID later, but what is the new um, I mean, it's not new. It's just it's just the, from a whether you like it or not, whether it is true or not. Uh, the actual emergency part of the pandemic is slowly coming to an end. So with that, there is a lot of pandemic air protections that were on healthcare coverage. So about three percent adults may still have access to subsidized coverage, for example, through the ACA, but uh, sometime around June and July, when these are estimated to lapse, uh, those 3 million people and then about the 15 million people will lose Medicaid coverage. So it's just when the emergency part of the pandemic is gonna end and these emergency waivers are gonna end, the people are gonna be automatically unenrolled and they will either chain based on their circumstances may need to re-enroll or look for other insurance coverage. And believe me, two, two, almost two, three years is a long time to be in insurance than to lose it suddenly. Mm -hmm. the, the, the pandemic has actually, if you, I mean, if you look at, you know, human history, disasters have of course been, you know, by, by definition very bad. But then they have also, you know, pushed for progress. If you look at, I mean, in Europe, uh, you know, they always uh, joke about um, uh, the, the Second World War, uh, you know, Americans brought freedom and Coca-Cola. Uh, I, I mean, there's more things that came from, from that time period, but what, what happens is, you know, I mean, if you look at the pandemic now, there's a lot of things which have been pushed forward. Value-based care is one. Um, and uh, going forward, if we can just like talk a little bit about the pandemic, um, how has the pandemic shaped and changed the core domains such as if, you know, we want to focus today on the social determinants of health, how has the pandemic shaped and changed the core domains such as housing, food? And speaking of food, uh, let, let me get back to Dr. Lucan because this is, this will be very interesting to have his perspective. Um, Dr. Lucan, please tell us a little bit about your journey. Um, you have spent so much uh, of your uh, of your time uh, focusing on food and food insecurity, and you've done a substantial amount of work in that area. Please uh, tell us a little bit about um, where 
your work has, you know, taken a turn with the pandemic and before? Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, I've, uh, you know, as mentioned at the start of the uh, conversation, I spent the last 12 years in academic medicine uh, and, you know, the majority of that time was engaged in research uh, around food and food access and nutrition related issues. Uh, and predominantly I was focused on uh, environmental determinants of people's uh, uh, eating choices uh, and what that meant for obesity and chronic disease. And so looking at what food sources were in the environment and what uh, food advertising was in the environment, so the availability of food and the cues to consume uh, and how that impacted different communities. Uh, and so, you know, I think a bottom line from the work is that uh, unhealthy food items are sort of disproportionately available uh, and disproportionately uh, advertised to populations who need them the least, uh, populations who are uh, the most affected by diet-related chronic diseases, uh, you know, obesity and cardiometabolic issues. And I think during the pandemic, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, only become uh, more of an issue or, you know, sort of the, that setting has become more problematic for those most at risk. Um, and so, you know, trying to figure, uh, you know, navigate our way out of that is going to take some thoughtful approaches, some of which will come from healthcare, some of which will come, you know, from, um, you know, broader uh, public health considerations. Um, but I think these are like complex problems uh, that require uh, multi-component approaches. Mm -hmm. New York City's underserved communities, um, it's quite a contrast in one area. I mean, uh, we, we have joked about how New York or even like a borough like Brooklyn is, is like a, a continent in itself with the different uh, degrees of, of change that we see when we move just you know, uh, two miles or three miles east or west. And that is something which, um, as f f physician executives, um, this is, you know, an area where we think about, we, we want to do something. Um, tell us a little bit about your work in the, in the Bronx. You had, you were at Albert Einstein with how did you see that the, 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 the you know, the, the companies that were selling food and alcohol and especially n not like, you know, fresh vegetables, but more like processed foods and and um, and, and basically just alcohol more advertised in those in those communities than, for instance, in in, in, in if you want to take the example in New York, uh, the, the, the typical example is is, is Manhattan, uh, lower Manhattan compared to Bronx, for instance, this, that is, so the driving force there is that the, the, the capitalist drive to, to profit is, is pushing towards more and more disparities and the social determinants of health are, one, one social determinants of, determinant of health might just be, you know, the capitalist drive to, to make money, which is making people at a disadvantage living in those communities compared to living in communities when they're not faced with with this type of pressure to, uh, to consume these foods. Tell us a little bit about what do you think is happening in, in, in those so v different neighborhoods of New York City? Um, well, I think it's a good point about, uh, you know, health disparities or disparities in health conditions uh, between neighborhoods. And, you know, you mentioned some of the different uh, communities in New York City and the surrounding areas. <laughs> Certainly, it's not unique to New York or the Northeast or, you know, even within America. But I think, you know, there are real um, uh, differences between uh, communities and the uh, food related challenges they face. So we did a study looking at uh, the Bronx versus the Upper East Side of Manhattan, the Bronx being, you know, predominantly of lower income minority representation, uh, you know, lesser educated, more poverty. Um, sort of, uh, you know, by many uh, measures, uh, a more vulnerable population, you know, compared to the Upper East Side, which is predominantly affluent white, 
And what we showed were enormous differences, not only in the amount of food that was available, but the type of food that was available and the type of food that was being advertised. Um, and so a bottom line is that, you know, there's more uh, opportunity uh, to purchase unhealthy food. There's more unhealthy food available from more places. Uh, and it's more highly promoted in uh, communities that sort of that, that need it the least. Um, and that's true between boroughs. So between these, you know, very stark, starkly different neighborhoods or communities. It's also true within broader uh, areas that you would think would be more homogenous. So even looking within the Bronx itself, which as I mentioned as a whole, uh, you know, predominantly has those characteristics of being, you know, lower income, uh, you know, high minority representation, lesser schooling, um, you know, more foreign born residents, et cetera. Uh, even within those, uh, within communities in the Bronx, you know, between neighborhoods, it's the communities that, you know, sort of highlight those uh, extreme characteristics the most that have the most issue with food and food access and unhealthy food being pushed. And so, you know, part of that, I think, is, uh, you know, related to what sells where, you know, there's a little bit of supply, there's a little bit of demand. Uh, and, you know, the combination of the two, you know, create an environment that is just, um, you know, not supporting health and working against the health that we're trying to achieve. Uh, and something that I think, you know, we have to be mindful of, aware about, and, you know, take into consideration, you know, particularly as healthcare entities, when we're, you know, largely focused one-on-one, -on -one, you know, particularly as physicians, uh, you know, counseling patients in the office, you know, providing advice, giving counsel, you know, being aware of the realities that they face once they, you know, leave the exam room and go out into the world and, uh, you know, are trying to navigate life beyond the 15 minutes that they spend with us in a visit. Um, you know, these are these are big considerations. Uh, and so trying to figure out how to help them succeed in those environments and be aware of those environments and advocate for healthier environments are all, you know, important uh, issues and, uh, you know, things we should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. At CCM Health, uh, you know, the gap identification. Um, so we, you know, look at prevention. I mean, the, the, the name of the game of value-based care is to shift upward the focus. That is, we're able to put the energy and the resources upstream and thus give the patients a chance to be in better health uh, by identifying care gaps and then closing those care gaps, and that's where the quality uh, is, is brought, and, and value also, because cost-wise, it makes more sense to do that, because whenever we are looking at, you know, catching the ball uh, at full speed, it's, uh, you know, hospitalizations, ER, intensive care, the bill just keeps going up. Um, so, and to, to talk about prevention, so we are looking at, you know, measuring how we can better measure and, and give a better patient experience by doing things preventively. So that's, that's one way to, uh, to address uh, these, uh, these outcomes. However, we are, I mean, right now, uh, CMS is, uh, is wanting to go in that direction. Dr. Baran, you will, you will tell us, uh, December 2021, the reimbursements have gone up. And uh, same thing for other insurance companies, they are reimbursing better. But is this something which we will see more and more? How do you see this going forward with, uh, let's say, you know, the federal um, uh, perspective? So if you said, Dr. Jeff, well, it is going more and more and it is here to stay. So one good example for this may be from a social determinants of health perspective as well, is all the changes in telehealth, right? So if you think about it, these people uh, living with food insecurity may have always had issues with broadband access or having a computer, this or that, but CMS now allows more flexibility in this telehealth stuff. So you can have a doctor visit, not just by video or not having an established in-person visit, especially if you don't have the means to travel there or something, you can do it via telephone. Uh, or you can do it more flexibly, even in some aspects via text message or something like that. So uh, from a social determinants of health perspective, CMS is aware of all these changes and they're just trying to incentivize 
all the good things that may come out of this, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh, so going forward, we'll, we'll see more and more incentives of value-based care. Correct. Going forward, that's the CMS pathway. They are trying to advance value-based purchasing, health equity, and then basically change the status quo. So fee for service is out the door and their strategic goal is to get rid of it, I would assume, sometime by 2030 and change almost all either to slowly at risk contracts or just value-based purchasing without the risk for the smaller just individual providers. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lucan, your work has been more with the Medicaid patient population, right? Um, well, I, I think it's been a mix. Uh, I mean, certainly there have been uh, Medicaid patients and, uh, you know, patients who, um, you know, were predominantly from lower income communities. Um, so, you know, uh, clinically, I had worked for many years at a federally qualified health center. And so, uh, you know, served a population or helped care for folks that were, you know, facing not just environmental challenges, like I alluded to, but, you know, also uh, financial challenges, which creates sort of a perfect storm, uh, you know, in terms of um, actioning on what might be, you know, the best intended medical advice. Um, but, you know, when you try to translate that into the real world, uh, there can be real impediments. Mm hmm um as far as the 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 younger population the the, the challenges are, are there too a, a bit different than medicare where you know you're looking at chronic conditions for sure two or more uh the medicaid uh patient population that need help that's an area where um i th i don't know what do you think dr Baran? is that an area where the, the Health and Correct. Human relations exactly. For Medicaid, the, there is an increased focus on social determinants. I mean, think about it. You have food insecurity. You have evictions. You have shelter options for these medically vulnerable, sometimes chronic individuals that lack stable housing. So it's becoming even more and more from a Medicaid perspective. The only issue is that uh, for some states, uh, there has been more of a push so there's been several options under medicaid how you can address the social determinants of health you can have section 1115 waivers that means that the federal funds are matching different strategies to hit and sort out the social determinants of health you can have also these advanced alternative payment models under these section 1115 waivers so more value-based purchasing more at-risk contracts and similar you can have integrated care models like we've discussed ad nauseum the acos and the patient-centered medical homes the pcmh you can have medicaid managed care flexibility in lieu of services and stuff but most of these also will take not just federal but some sort of state integration mm -hmm. and unfortunately there is not that many states that as of 2021 that have picked up these different home healthcare models. Last count I checked, there were about 28, 29 states that had, had no health home models. So from a Medicaid population perspective, no real option or no real way of trying to tackle these social determinants of health. And that goes with value-based purchasing as well, because those two are starting to go really hand by hand. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a Harvard study that came out uh, where it's, it's quite amazing. So it's the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies. So race, which is non-white ethnicity, um, a reduced income level, less than high school education or being a veteran has been now uh, confirmed to be a, a higher risk for COVID-19 mortality. So speaking of social determinants of health, um, so going forward, um, I, I hope that, you know, we'll be looking at more and more effort on, on the side of both uh, the federal and the state governments to, to address those. As far as the state goes, Dr. Baran, we are, we're in New York, so <laughs> tell us a little bit about the New York situation. So uh, New York, I mean, being in the Northeast, it's one of the states that has always been more generous and liberal in its thinking and approach to things. 
So uh, there is, I believe, two health home models in New York, and uh, the bulk of it has been published or given under Section 1115 waivers. I don't know off the top of my head the exact ones, but I do know they are trying to do things with the social determinants of health. Maybe Dr. Wilkin may know more as he's more boots on the ground in New York, but uh, I think there's some uh, federal funding and projects with regards to particulars of uh, neighborhood and physical environment, and uh, as well as uh, just uh, housing. But I don't know what they're doing, if they're doing anything with regards to food security in that context. Dr. Luca? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I have a little bit of a different perspective now, uh, you know, working at a company that contracts uh, with other companies, corporations to care for their employees. So, you know, all the patients that I see now uh, are, are cover, covered by that benefit, right? So, so we offer for, you know, preventive services uh, to everyone, which is, you know, fully uh, addressed, you know, outside of an insurance-based model uh, or, you know, as an add-on there too. Um, so, you know, from the, you know, insurance and reimbursement standpoint, we're sort of insulated from those considerations, but that doesn't, you know, eliminate, uh, you know, the issues that people face, you know, in their home and uh, community settings um, that, you know, merit, consideration and, you know, may need to be addressed, right? So, you know, the best intended uh, clinical advice falls flat if you, you know, uh, you know, patients leave the office and then have to, uh, you know, figure out how to implement that in a setting that, you know, works against their, their interests. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it sort of translates across, you know, different uh, healthcare settings, different reimbursement models, you know, different sort of pay structures, um, you know, the environmental context matters uh, and, you know, how much of an issue it is, you know, certainly relates to some of these other things, but, you know, they are, um, um, they're issues that, you know, re require attention and that merit consideration and, uh, you know, interventions, um, you know, beyond uh, in, in thoughts about insurance or coverage. Yeah, and then uh, Dr. Jeff, well, to add, uh, I think New York is doing two main things. Is one is MTM, medically tailored meals. So if you're a Medicaid managed care organization, you may provide MTMs, meaning you may provide medical special meals to people with cancer, diabetes, heart failure, or any chronic diseases and have may have had hospitalizations and these are delivered to people's houses. And they are trying to get going what's called street medicine. So basically, if you're providing any offsite services to the homeless population, you will be able to bill for them. And this is like uh, you, uh, not in the context of a post hospitalization. This is like this is like regular. Exactly. Let's say Joe Dirt is a homeless person and he's living in the street. And if you are a provider that was looking to work with these patient population, or if he's already been an established client but is now homeless, you'll be able to bill for any care you sort of deliver in his home, which is the street. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, like Dr. Lucan said, you know, there's, uh, of course, there's the, the covered population, which is substantial. I mean, it has gone up also. With the Affordable Care Act, there's a lot more people covered now compared to what it was. Um, and so th those are, th that's one population. And then you have those, of course, we still don't have coverage in the medic, you know, under, under 65. Um, I'm not like jumping from one topic to the other, but um, talking about, you know, something that affects everybody, I, just, I wanted to both have both of you comment on you know, the, this, the current situation with uh, gun violence in, in the U.S., uh, that has um, always been a, an Achilles heel. And uh, with what happened tragically in Texas, that discussion has come back up. Dr. Lucan, what, what are your thoughts as that, as a social determinant of health? Uh, well, I mean, so I, I think... Uh, I think gun violence is a problem that is a uniquely American one and, um, you know, is a complex issue uh, contributed by 
uh, multiple considerations, not the least of which are some that, you know, relate directly to social determinants, uh, you know, particularly in the setting of the pandemic. I think in one of the JAMA journals recently, there was, um, you know, a categorization or a, a description of what the, you know, pandemic level change has meant for gun violence. And maybe not surprisingly, you know, rates have gone up. Uh, and I think, you know, Uvalde and, and Buffalo are just the latest exclamation points on that problem. Um, and, you know, Buffalo, even more dishearteningly, seeming to be racially motivated, um, which is not only sickening, but like, you know, speaks to broader sort of social upheaval and, you know, social determinants, uh, you know, like we're framing this discussion around. So, you know, I think these are complex issues. I mean, they relate to um, you know, not only to gun access, but like the inclination to, um, you know, e exact violence against, you know, people um, and, and sort of, um, you know, also relate to, um, you know, where people are in terms of their mental health, where they are in terms of their um, um, just overall wellness, right? So like in the context of financial strain, job loss, economic upheaval, um, you know, um, uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation campaigns, uh, the sense of distrust in the government or in your, you know, fellow neighbors, uh, the sense of uh, things being taken away or, you know, the, um, uh, the idea of replacement theory, right? So, you know, all of these things kind of mixed together to create, you know, a perfect storm of incendiary uh, conditions to, you know, uh, along with gun access lead to these, you know, horrific and catastrophic events. But, you know, it, it's notable that, you know, while we have a real problem with mass shootings in this country, you know, sort of exponentially or, you know, orders of magnitude more than, uh, you know, similar countries around the world, or similar, similarly positioned countries around the world. I mean, the real epidemic of gun violence is really more on a single victim scale, uh, and it relates to you know person-on-person -person homicides and and suicides. Um, and so these are real issues, and again, relate to uh, the social determinants, right? So when people's lives are in upheaval, um, you know, there's often you know desperation and discontent and uh, you know, conditions that relate to people taking, you know, extreme and uh, dangerous measures. And so the more I think we can, um, so I, I, I will say, I don't, I don't think the solutions to this kind of uh, problem are simple ones. I think they're complex issues that require perhaps non-intuitive solutions. And so while I applaud, you know, some of the measures directed at you know, gun control, you know, red flag laws and background checks and, you know, the like, I, I think that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the issue. I, I mean, I think it relates to, you know, education and economic support and, uh, you know, other social services to help people improve, you know, the quality of their lives and the, uh, um, you know, help ensure more stability overall so that there's less of these sort of uh, incendiary events that that lead to you know international i mean you know um uh, uh, catastrophes of uh you know um uh with international attention i actually uh my hometown is minneapolis so uh in the george floyd you know event of two years ago um was something which kind of like shook the world but <laughs> It was like right, you know, not so far from where my parents live. So, you know, this gun violence and violence in general in America, which is a very, very, you know, American thing. The way the way it happens is, is very American. Other places it happens, but that's like, oh, you know, they're, they're now becoming American. It's really very a, a U.S., uh, uniquely U.S. thing. I mean, and that, of course, has to do with the political will. I mean, we have to take responsibility. I mean, the, the one thing is to say and the other thing is to do something about it. And I think, you know, this is something where as physician executives, uh, of course, we are not sitting in Congress and, and making laws, but even outside of 
you know, people who, who have s some kind of say, because we do have, you know, some more power than others. But still, I think everybody has to do whatever they can. If you, you know, if, if you just say, you know, I can't do anything about it, nothing is, is going to, nothing is going to be like changing, uh, because it's such a difficult thing to move. I mean, that needle has been like, so difficult to move. It keeps happening and, and we just can't get a grip on it. I mean, Violence in general, if you look at New York right now, taking the subway has become something to think about. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, New York has always been uh, a little bit prone to violence, but right now it's, 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 been, it's gone up. And, um, and social, as a social determinant of health, violence in the street, you know, people very simply uh, won't go out for a walk where they... Well, they should, you know, instead of being inside, if they go out and, and take some fresh air, walk for like uh, 15, 20 minutes, that's, that's something which, you know, uh, which, 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 is, which is required. And if they don't do that, or other things, uh, you know, very, very, very basic. So gun violence is, is something which for sure we'll have to kind of deal with. Uh, Dr. Baran, uh, please. What are your yes, thoughts? So I, I take a more contrarian and opposite approach here. So one is that I think it's just our perception of the, a lot of the violence, right? So data doesn't necessarily support that this is this crime is up, that is up, this is up. So especially from 1980s, a lot of the crime is down. Second thing is we now all have Twitter, social media, and all these interconnectedness. So if someone is randomly assaulted in the New York subway, you may have never heard this in 1990, but now in two seconds, it's on your phone. So I think we are getting a lot more bias to what is actually going on. That's one. Number two, I, this is, as you said, everyone said, this is a purely American thing. So it tends to get a lot of political aspects to it. But even before that, I think we need to tackle the debt of the expertise, the debt of trust in experts, the debt of trust in science, because forget about the gun violence. We lost about close to 200,000 people from the Delta way. You know, these people could have been vaccinated. These people could have been done that. These people could have been done this. So I think a lot of the social determinants of health should come in before to get these people better integrated into the healthcare system, because maybe the next year they won't trust us when we tell them they need to take the metformin for the diabetes because some random doctor has told them that uh, colchicine works better for diabetes than metformin. So I think this is more integral part that this all boils down to that there's a lack of trust in science and lack of trust in people that preach science. Mm -hmm. We are coming to our to the end here, Dr. Brown, one or two takeaways from our podcast today. I think it doesn't matter what you do. Social determinants of health will help determine the outcome for your patients. And if you are trying to stay relevant, trying to maximize your billing and try to stay practice, you need to get on the train because the train is leaving. And from a government regulatory perspective, there's a lot of push to get value-based purchasing on the road. That means the outcome of your patient will matter on how much you get paid. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lukan, one or two uh, takeaways? Yeah, well, I, um, I'm, I know we covered sort of a scattershot range of topics. I'm trying to find a common thread. I mean, I, I guess my takeaway would be, you know, some of these uh, health issues are complex problems that don't often have intuitive solutions or um, necessarily uh, single component solutions. So sometimes the fix uh, may be multidimensional and require thinking very much outside the box and certainly outside the exam room. Um, and I think, you know, as there's more accountability, in, you know, including with, you know, accountable care and, you know, holding uh, physicians to outcomes for their total populations, we need to be thinking beyond what happens in the exam room uh, and, you know, what occurs out in communities and how we can, you know, support our patients creatively, um, you know, to navigate those waters. And there, you know, are lots of potential ways that I think physicians can be involved, both practically one-on-one -on -one with patients or, you know, in larger sort of, uh, you know, advocacy efforts or, uh, you know, community initiatives. Um, but I, I do think, uh, social determinants matter quite a bit and ignoring them uh, is going to um, 
you know, not result in the, you know, quality, which is, you know, one of the three uh, components of the triple aim, you know, one of the foundational ones uh, that, that we hope to deliver and promise to deliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the saying goes, you can't change without changing. Um, something which, in my experience, uh, working in population health, uh, I still have to say that there's a lot of physicians who are resistant to change. A um, simple thing like technology. Um, now, social determinants of health is, like Dr. Lucan said, it's, it's, you know, we, we tried to cover a few, but we just touched uh, you know, on, on what is even a, a much larger. Uh, anything that you know, is out there that affects somebody's um, thinking or somebody's access to health or to well-being is a, is, a, is a determinant of health. So something which uh, we can do is, of course, um, uh, know that uh, always you know, put, putting patients first, uh, doing things that make sense for patients. Um, so, uh, of course, embracing technology, doing virtual if possible. Uh, we won't be talking about the planet today because that's another, that's another topic uh, that maybe another podcast some sometime. Uh, but um, moving the needle, yeah, uh, that's something which um, is uh, is going to be uh, a challenge going forward. And we want to um, always do things that matter to, matter to people. Um, and uh, as uh, leaders in the community. Uh, I think you know the idea is to always press on, on, on not becoming complacent um, because everybody can do something, even if you're not in a position of power. You can write a letter, do something because uh, you, if there are problems out there, they're not going to get solved by themselves. And saying that nothing is going to happen is not a way to go. Just going out there and vote, maybe and vote with your conscience. This way, somebody who. It represents your values. Might you know uh, do something in in, in a political uh, situation where you know the law will change and things will will move forward. So um, I'm really really happy to have you guys today. I mean, it was uh, it, it's it's a topic very difficult to grasp in in 30 minutes podcast. But the, the idea is to get the conversation going. Uh, we will, of course, uh, touch base on on, on topics uh, and, of course, the social determinants of health going forward. And uh, I thank you both. Thank you, our viewers for joining us. And uh, have a good rest of your day, both of you. And uh, same thing for our viewers and listeners. Uh, and stay safe. Thank you. Have a nice.